floor is yours. Well, uh, thanks for the invitation and thanks for organizing. So, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so I'm uh, talking about something that's uh, sort of marginally related to random walks, let's say. Um, so, yeah, in case you do have any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt me. And um, otherwise, I hope uh, that it'll start uh, as basic so as to, uh, well, um, so that everyone can take uh, one part or another from this talk. So uh, as the title suggests, I'm going to talk about uh, critical percolation exponents for, uh, for an integrable model. And this model is introduced by, or is uh, induced by random walks. So it's pretty, pretty closely related to the Gaussian free field effect. And um, all that I'm going to talk about is joint work with Alexis Prévost, who's in uh, Cambridge, at least uh, officially, uh, Otherwise, he's in France, I guess. And uh, Pierre Francois Rodriguez, who is uh, officially at Imperial, but physically in Zurich. So here you see the two uh, the pre pandemic times in a pub close to IHS. So these were, uh, I guess, <laughs> happier times from a certain point of view. Um, Right, so let me uh, start with uh, recalling uh, Bernoulli percolation, which probably is uh, known to most of you, and uh, take this as a motivation and then come to the kind of questions that we're investigating and uh, trying to answer in this uh, model, which is not Bernoulli percolation, but uh, sort of a GFF uh, level set percolation model. All right, so Bernoulli percolation has been introduced uh, in the 40s of the last century. So uh, motivated by the investigation of uh, gelation of polymers and then mathematically uh, Broadband and Hammersley in their research on gas masks uh, introduced it properly. And essentially what you do, so in this uh, model of uh, bond percolation, uh, for each bond you say it's either open or closed if you're in ZD. So you have a look at nearest neighbor bonds and you choose them open with probability P or close with probability one minus P, and you do so in an independent fashion. And it turns out that you find a critical uh, probability uh, PC, which is strictly positive and strictly smaller than one. So that means that a, um, like a non-trivial phase transition is taking place in such a way that if you choose P smaller than this critical P, um, then you only find bounded connected components of open bonds, right? And if you increase P, you know, or you, it's obvious that you expect more open bonds. And it turns out that if you have more than PC, then you can actually find a unique unbounded connected component of open bonds. So uh, in a small simulation here, you see what's happening in 2D bond percolation. So that's a very special case. And uh, the P we're choosing here is uh, 0 0.4. And uh, if you try to go, say, from left to right by just using uh, black bonds, so the black guys are the ones which are open, uh, then you see that you will fail, in fact. And uh, so what you can do is you can increase your probability and see uh, where a certain change is taking place. And then at uh, P equal to one half, it's not so easy to see anymore whether you can actually go from left to right just using um, just using black bonds. So here you can't obviously, but then you can have a look at other clusters and see whether you're more successful. So here it's not obvious whether you can do this or not, at least to me. Um, and it turns out that uh, this is a very special case because in the 2D bond calculation case, uh, one half is the critical parameter. So in general, you can't say much about critical parameters, but uh, this is one uh, special case where you actually can determine the critical parameter, and that has been done by uh, Keston, essentially. So if you increase P further, then you see that it's actually not that hard anymore to go from left to right just using uh, leg burns. So I'm not trying to find one here, but it looks like pretty much uh, well, you have to work a little bit in order to fail if you, if you, don't want, if you do want to get stuck in this thing. But essentially, this tells you that Typically, you, you can go from left to right just using open bonds in this, uh, in this picture. OK, so, um, so uh, we have seen what's happening if you uh, let p vary. And then uh, the subcritical phase, which is the one where p is smaller than pc, 
uh, as well as the supercritical phase, they have been pretty well understood by now. I mean, uh, there have been classical results, for example, by Menshikov on the exponential decay of the radius function if you're uh, in the uh, subcritical regime. Uh, you do have, in particular, as a consequence of this, finite expected cluster size and so on. So this is by no means um, by no means uh, complete. This list of uh, results is just uh, an indicator that, uh, in fact, a lot is known if you're either in the subcritical regime or in the supercritical regime. So uh, you have further results in the supercritical regime. And um, well, okay, so Grimmett's book is already more than 20 years old, but it's still a pretty good reference if you if you want to understand a lot of the material that is actually understood in this set. So that's in the off critical regime that means where P is uh, different from PC. Now what we are interested in is a uh, near critical percolation which means that uh, you choose your P close to PC. So as I said in general you don't know what PC is but uh, for example in this case of uh, 2D bond percolation you do and there's a couple of other interesting cases where you do know what PC is. Um, yeah, so this is what I recapitulate over here. That's what I mentioned verbally before, that uh, PC is the critical parameter. And in fact, you also know that in dimension two at criticality, you don't have percolation. So you only find bounded connected components of open bonds. And also, uh, if you have a look at uh, certain planar settings, such as the hexagonal or triangular lattices, then um, you can actually compute critical exponents for the nulli percolation. Um, so this has been done uh, quite some time ago by Smirnov and Werner. And um, so, yeah, so basically the techniques involved are conformal invariance and SLE, which is uh, very much two dimensional or like uh, powerful in two dimensions, let's say. And that's why the two dimensional case uh, by now has been reasonably well. well I mean, better understood say than three or higher dimensions. And also if you're in high dimensions, uh, then you can uh, uh, use lace expansion techniques in order to get an understanding and essentially you obtain a mean field behavior, which uh, is supposedly comparable to that what's happening on the tree. So you do have a lot of independence if dimensions are high. Now, if you have a look at what's happening in uh, say Z3, then in fact, not much is known. So, for example, you do not even know whether if at criticality you do have percolation or not, right? So this is one of the major open problems in this field, whether um, at criticality you do percolate or you do not percolate. So it's expected that you do not, but um, uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, as I said, one of the major open questions in the field, right? So here theta of P, C or C, uh, theta of P is the percolation probability. So the probability that you can connect uh, the origin uh, to infinity using open bonds in this percolation setting. Uh, so there has been recent progress, uh, for example, by Seth, uh, who proved lower bounds on true arm exponents at criticality, but still um, the, the picture is pretty, uh, pretty badly understood so far when it comes to Bernoulli percolation at criticality in um, three dimensions. So the model that we'll be investigating is not Bernoulli percolation, but a model that uh, has way less independence properties. Uh, and it comes from the discrete Gaussian free field, uh, which a priori looks harder to investigate just because you have a very strong dependence uh, inherent to the model. But then it turns out that there's uh, miraculously um, symmetries that you can use and uh, actually uh, obtain quite, uh, quite good information. All right, so let me introduce the uh, GFF. So essentially uh, what we'll have a look at is a transient countably infinite graph. So you can think of uh, Z3, say, if you like. And we'll also allow for symmetric weights on this graph. And then this induces a Markov chain, which has uh, the transition matrix given by uh, PXY, where you have the conductance of one of the, uh, one of the bonds. Uh, divided by the sum of the conductances of all the outgoing bonds, right? So this is your um, um, random conductance model or, yeah, I mean, we don't have randomness in the lambda, but it's just like uh, how you get from putting conductances on the bonds a certain Markov chain. So if you have this Markov chain, then you can have a look at the green function. So as I said, we, we assume the graph to be transient. So in particular, the green function is bounded 
And this means that this expression over here uh, is certainly finite. And then we can say, okay, uh, the GFF is nothing else than a centered Gaussian process that is indexed by the uh, vertex set of our underlying graph. So for example, the sites in Z3. So we want the guy to be centered. That means expectation zero. And we also assume that the covariance is given by the green function. Now, for this to be possible, you have to know that uh, the green function is symmetric positive definite, but in fact it is. So this is a well-defined Gaussian process, right? And okay, just because of the green function, uh, which involves a lot of dependence uh, due to the random walk trajectories, you already see that uh, probably that's on the next slide. Yeah, uh, you do have a uh, pretty strong correlation. So that means the covariance between two sides or the field of two sides, uh, just in case algebraically, so uh, you have the distance between the two uh, vertices to the two minus D. Okay. And um, okay, so up here I had some further information on the GFF in case you haven't seen it before. So essentially, if you, if you consider only uh, a finite subset of ZD. And then you can show that the density is actually proportional to what I wrote here on the right-hand side. So you see that you do have a Gaussian increments between two neighboring vertices. And uh, so that's also why people consider this to be a D-dimensional analog of Brownian motion. D-dimensional, not in the sense of space, but in the sense of the index. Okay, um, questions so far? <clears throat> All right, so we know when we have this random process, the, uh, the Gaussian free field, and uh, what we are interested in is a percolation model that's induced by this, uh, by this stochastic process or by this random field. And a natural candidate for this is to have a look at the so-called excursion sets. That means you have a look at uh, all those sites in your graph or all those vertices where the field takes values larger than a certain threshold. So that's what we denote by, uh, by this uh, E larger than or equal to H of G. That means you have a look at all those uh, vertices in the graph such that the field takes value at least H. Okay, so this gives you a random subset of your graph and you can, as before for the nulli calculation, you can say, okay, you say that we are now in the edge, uh, sorry, in the side set or vertex setting and set instead of bonds, but you say that the vertex is open if phi of x takes value larger than h, and then you see that if you let vary h, then this corresponds essentially to letting vary p in the case of uh, Bernoulli population. And you can make this more rigorous if you like, but uh, essentially this just tells you it's a percolation problem, and now the parameter that you're tuning is h, but not p anymore. So then, uh, we had PC for Bernoulli percolation, which was the critical level. And uh, in a similar way, you could ask, well, uh, do you have a critical level in this set? So if you say you have a look at all those H such that the probability of, um, of the uh, excursion set not having an infinite connected component, this guy being zero, right? So if you, if you lower H, then the probability is increasing um that this thing here has an unbounded cluster just because you're taking more and more sites in your in your random set so you can ask okay how small can i actually take my h such that i still have zero probability of seeing an unbounded cluster in this excursion set now this has been introduced by libovitz and seller in the 86 or no, so that's quite some time ago <clears throat> and um it is not obvious uh, whether this guy here, for example, is uh, strictly smaller than infinity and strictly larger than minus infinity, right? So this would correspond to PC strictly between zero and one. And it turns out that there's models like, for example, random interlacements where you do have, if you have a look at the model of random interlacements, in case you know it, um, you don't see a percolation phase transition if you have a look at the model and uh, the intensity parameter U, because for any positive U, you always have a, 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 like a connected infinite component. Uh, but there, you, what you do is you go to the vacant set in order to see something interesting in terms of percolation. So what we do is um, we start from this GFF, uh, the discrete version, and then uh, what we add is a, a so-called cable system. So what does it mean? It tells you that, uh, say, 
you have your uh, discrete graph over here. So that's just say a subset of uh, Z2 or Z3. Or let's take uh, Z3 because we want it to be transient. Um, so these are vertices. And then what you do is you add line segments uh, between any two neighboring vertices. So then what you obtain is a continuum model or a continuum graph in some sense. So this really all, all the blue guys are line segments of the uh, say length one half. Um, that comes uh, due to normalization, but doesn't really matter so much. But essentially, what we can now do is we have our field at these discrete values, right? So this is the GFF that I just introduced. And what we do is that if we have the value here and here, then we interpolate uh, on this cable, what's uh, what we call the blue guy over here, uh, by taking a Brownian bridge that goes from, say, if you have a uh, this is uh, say phi x, this here is phi y, if you can read this. Um, and then, so if you have a value of phi x to this side, this here is a, has a value of phi y, then what you, um, let me see whether we can. Um, okay, let's say this here is one value, this is another value, and then what we do, we interpolate between using a Brownian bridge, uh, if that's um, hopefully uh, clear what I'm saying. <clears throat> so in words, uh, this is what I just described. Um, you add these line segments, and then you interpolate your field on any line segment by taking the values of the discrete GFF, and uh, you have a look at the Brownian bridge that goes from one value to the other value. This gives you a random continuous uh, function on this line segment. And you do this for any line segment. Now you might ask, okay, what's the benefit of this? And uh, it turns out that uh, in some sense, this brings in analysis. So um, there are things like isomorphism theorems where essentially you have a square um, in whatever you know about your GFF. And if you have a look at the square of the field, then you don't know whether it's positive or negative. But if you have this line segment and you say, I uh, have the square here and the square here, and you have a look at uh, the Brownian bridge in between, then you can detect the sign change because uh, this process is continuous and it would have to cross zero in case uh, there's a sign change between the two values here and here. All right, so what I said is one way to, to do this. And another way is to say, okay, you might as well say um, you, you realize your uh, you discrete GFF, and then you say you add a bond that is connecting these two guys, X and Y, with a certain probability that is given by uh, this expression over here. And this is nothing else than uh, the probability that the Brownian bridge from phi X to phi Y stays positive. Is that uh, clear? So what you do is you start with generating your discrete guy, then you add the Brownian bridges, and then this is the same adding Brownian bridges and the Brownian bridge staying positive is the same as asking uh, you add a bond uh, with this probability. So you do so if and only if the Brownian bridge is staying positive on this, on this uh, line segment. So this gives you a continuous model. And uh, again, you have long range correlation. And uh, what we want to do is we want to investigate what's happening near criticality. So uh, what we do for this purpose is we introduce uh, uh, the excursion set. So that's just the uh, continuum analog or the cable system analog, so to say, of this, uh, of this um, same guy here without, uh, sorry, without the tilde, right? So we have this excursion set and uh, this is now the same thing, but on the cable graph. Uh, we consider the cluster of the origin. That means you consider all those vertices uh, in the cable system, which are connected to the origin uh, in this excursion set uh, above level H. And again, you can vary your parameter H and ask, okay, what's the effect on the entire system by, by letting H vary? So we also have a look at the percolation function or rather here it's the uh, non-percolation function because that allows us to formulate things a bit nicer. So that's just the probability that the cluster containing the origin is bounded, okay? Um, so that's one minus theta of P from what you know from or what I showed you in Bernoulli percolation. And uh, so then we can also have a look at this critical parameter. And we say, okay, we take the infimal H such that the probability of this cluster being bounded is equal to one. 
that's uh, exactly the same thing that I introduced in the discrete system. So we also introduced the radius function, uh, the truncated one, which means that uh, you restrict to this um, excursion set being bounded and or the cluster set, uh, the cluster of the origin being bounded. And you ask, what's the probability that nevertheless, you connect the origin to the boundary of a ball of radius n? And in a similar way, you can define the truncate two, uh, truncated two-point function. So again, same thing as before, you, you truncate. And you ask, uh, what's the probability that uh, x is in the cluster of the origin? Okay, so these are these are the, the quantities that we want to investigate. And now I told you that a priori it's even not clear what the critical value of PC is. And it turns out that here it's actually uh, very explicit, namely this critical H, uh, so where is it, um, H star tilde here, you can determine it explicitly. And in fact, uh, you can also show, so first of all, you can show it's zero in any dimension. <clears throat> And you can also show that at criticality, uh, you don't have percolation. So at criticality, the probability of the cluster being bounded, the cluster containing the origin, that's equal to one. Um, and that's, so, uh, so that's actually pretty generic. So, I mean, I said here, that's our standing assumptions, but then on a lot of graphs such that, uh, for example, um, Lupu showed it uh, on uh, ZD and also for certain general graphs. And uh, you have to work a little bit in order actually to find graphs where these things or these uh, equalities are not true. So uh, Alexi did this in a paper of his and he found some examples where actually the critical level is different from zero, but uh, they are more, more or less, um, well, I mean, very non-typical. So for any uh, any uh, vertex transitive graph that is transient, for example, you have the, these equalities. So that's pretty impressive, I think, just because uh, in general, you, well, if you have a look at Bernoulli percolation, there's not much that you can say about this anyways. And here it seems that due to the symmetries of the system, it's actually uh, the net or, or the normal case that uh, you know the critical value and you don't have percolation at criticality. So what we also assume is a regular volume growth. So for example, that's fulfilled in any ZD. Uh, so that means that if you're in ZD, then uh, our alpha just uh, is equal to D, okay? But this works for also like uh, dimensions which are non-integer. So I mean, there's stuff like this Toblerone graph, which I'm not going to talk about, but you can think of certain pre-fractal graphs that actually fulfill these things and uh, tag values that are not integers. We also need certain regularity on the green function, but also this is uh, nothing too demanding. So here, for example, we want that the green function decays as the distance to the minus nu. So if you're in the case uh, ZD, uh, then you have that nu is actually uh, D minus two. Okay. Uh, and we also need the uh, uniform electricity. Um, okay, but that's say not our not our main uh, main turf anyway to get as as general assumptions as possible. Okay, so these are the uh, standing assumptions that we are working under. And as I try to convince you, these are pretty generic uh, in the sense that if you take any ZD for example, they have fulfilled any vertex transitive graph that it's transient, it's uh, fulfilling these things. So it's actually not not asking much. So as I said, these things uh, have, among others, been investigated by Lupu. And uh, so he showed that uh, at criticality, so for uh, h equal to zero, uh, you do have that the two-point function is given by this expression here. And in particular, you can show that uh, it decays like d zero x to the minus nu, because uh, g zero x goes to zero. And also Ding and Wirf have been computing bounds on this radius function here um, in the special case of Z3 uh, and also at criticality. And these are results that we are recovering from, from our findings later on as well. So one crucial quantity in the investigations is, uh, is the so-called capacity. So 
okay, what you need is uh, essentially that's a measure of, uh, of your set as uh, seen by random walk coming from infinity. Um, and uh, importantly, <clears throat> sorry, if you're, if you're under the assumptions that I gave you, then uh, balls of radius R have a capacity that's proportional to R to the new, where new was the parameter that came from the degree function DK. So in particular, if you have a ball in uh, Z3, uh, then you see that the capacity uh, is uh, more or less equal to R, if R is the, uh, the radius of the ball. <clears throat> so maybe uh, since uh, I'm a bit short on time, uh, let me uh, jump this and go to a sketch, which is telling you more, I guess, than, um, than going through these uh, results. Um, namely, what we can compute are, well, we get certain bounds from which we can in particular infer the critical exponents, as I was uh, suggesting in the title. So uh, in this, uh, so first of all, these two things here are the scaling relations are also hyperscaling relations. Uh, which are okay, well, certainly well accepted in physics, and you can also derive in our models some of the, these scaling relations uh, rigorously. And they give you relations between the different uh, critical parameters. So the critical parameters, I, I wrote them down here. There's a cheat sheet. And there are relations between these, and these scaling relations are essentially more or less accepted, and the hyperscaling relations are a bit more. Uh, say, um, well, uh, conjectural, let's say. I mean, physicists take it for granted anyways, but for example, uh, these things, they won't be true in mean field anymore. But um, nevertheless, this is something that physicists work with in lower dimensions also. So uh, here in the first line, you see the exponents. Um, then in the second line, you see the values which uh, these exponents take in our model. Um, I should say, okay, I did, uh, I did this before. So what we, what we actually uh, consider is uh, uh, the case new smaller than or equal to one for the time being. So in terms, uh, in the terms that I gave you that corresponds uh, to being larger than two dimensions and uh, smaller than or equal to three dimensions if you're talking about ZD, for example. And the red guys are the ones which we can compute explicitly over here. And then the remaining ones you can infer using uh, the scaling relations over here. And uh, you can compare them with those values for Bernoulli percolation. But as I said, Bernoulli percolation is not really well understood uh, in that or, uh, at criticality in Z3. So that's why I put these uh, approximate things here because they are essentially, uh, well, these are coming from uh, physics computations and approximations. <clears throat> so may, maybe there's two things that I want to mention over here. First of all, uh, the critical exponents do not depend on the microscopic stu uh, structure of the underlying graph. So I told you that uh, what we need is, for example, this uh, volume growth, like regular volume growth and green function decay. But these are properties that are asymptotic, like large scale. Uh, and they don't really care about what's happened on, um, on a microscopic level. So in that sense, we have a certain universality in the system. And also, um, uh, in the case of diffusive random walks, to so say uh, if you're in a ZD and take the dimension, uh, take it to six from below. So that corresponds to a new going to a four from below. And you actually see that uh, these values here that we obtain in our model converge to the mean field values for Bernoulli population. And so uh, the, the um, the Manoli population, they also have these, uh, I think it's called epsilon expansion or something like that. So they have a look at dimension six minus epsilon. And there, essentially, you can see that below six dimensions, our values are still different from the ones from the Manoli population. But uh, as uh, six, well, from six onwards, uh, they coincide. OK, so um, let me maybe give you a short uh, glimpse on the proof. So for the upper bound, what we do is we use uh, differential inequalities. So differential inequalities have been intensively used in percolation. Uh, so it's uh, 
So nothing groundbreaking news, certainly, but uh, still you always have to see, okay, what's uh, the differential inequality that uh, gives you what you want? So there's a little bit of work involved actually. Um, and then the lower bound is uh, actually, I guess, a bit more um, innovative, I would say. So there's a couple of uh, tools that we need. So first of all, we need a change of measure formulas for the GFF. So we want to shift our GFF on compact sets and um, uh, we have to pay a price for this obviously so there's change of measures involved then there's isomorphism theorems as i was alluding to so these ones are essentially relating the gaussian free field and interlacement local times in a certain way so that allows you to try to construct unbounded clusters in one model from unbounded clusters in another model so this is what the isomorphism uh, theorems give you and we also need, uh, but that's more for the specialists, uh, like a certain critical local uniqueness for the interlacement process, which comes into play through this uh, isomorphism. So if I have uh, two more minutes, I'll show you um, a picture. So there's essentially three steps involved. If you want to connect the origin um, to the boundary of a ball of radius R in your level set uh, for slightly positive levels. So first of all, what you do is you explore your cluster around zero, and uh, then this cluster essentially goes up to the correlation length of the system with a probability that's correlation length to the minus nu over two. So that's uh, this red guy over here. So we explore the red guy up to the boundary of the ball of radius psi, and that's happening like uh, the, the set extends up to this boundary with a reasonably high probability. So that gives you the first thing. Then the second one is um, uh, we are essentially connecting the ball of radius psi to a ball of radius a large multiple of psi um, in this in a certain variant of the interlacement process, which is killed once it hits this thing over here. But still, you can show that you actually do have a connection going from here to here, and then. Once you're far enough away, you're actually uh, good enough to say that you do not really feel what has been going on over here. And that means you can do, or you can use this critical uniqueness that I was talking to. Then you get an X or you get a connection in the GFF above a certain negative level, and you still have to slightly shift it in order to get it above this slightly positive level. So I know that's uh, probably a bit rough, uh, but the, the details are. Uh, are a bit complicated and the devil's in the details here, I would say. So um, I guess my time's up and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. So we, we have time for a quick question. You know, maybe, maybe me. I have a so so. You usually do this in in dimension three or higher, but can you say something in dimension two? In the sense that, for example, you, you work on the half plane, or you work on on on. Um. Well, uh, so yeah, I mean uh, that's a good question. Certainly, uh, we didn't investigate this, and um, I am not completely sure. Um, say how you would uh, like if you're in the half plane how exactly would for example um get this uh, so where is it uh, i mean you do have right i mean for example as you as a if in your works also you, you do have these isomorphisms right you can still do this that's yeah. certainly like 